Hello and welcome to session two of the new members course called Connect about church membership at Allen Heights Baptist Church. Who is teaching this course? Well, it's Pastor Brian Everett of Allen Heights Baptist Church. I am the pastor here and glad to be able to serve you in this capacity. You're obviously here because you're interested in church membership at Allen Heights Baptist Church which we are exploring over these three sessions. So hopefully you've already watched session one, and now we're going to dive into this session. The basis for this class is simply so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. As we explain this, once you are saved, a baptized believer, and you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and confessed him as your savior, obviously you are now uh, in God's household along with the saints and the brothers and sisters in Christ and God as our Father. So you join together with the body of believers. And church membership is a way of joining the covenant team, covenant, creating a covenant together with God's people. So what are we covering today? This second session is all about our statements. What is it that Baptists truly believe? So we hope to dive right into that. What is it truly? So what we've done is taken the word Baptist and created an acronym. And so as we explore this today, there are seven statements, and I'm sure there's more, but seven that we will explore today in this session to be able to, to express to you or to share with you interested in church membership, what is it we believe? First of all is biblical authority. <clears throat> we believe that the Bible is God's word, the very word of God. So that starts off with the letter B. All scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right, 2 Timothy 3.16. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, we also thank God continually when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but actually as it is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. God's word is the only completely reliable and truthful authority. And we accept the Bible as our manual for living. Our first question should always be when you face a decision, what does the Bible say? And surely we don't ask that all the time, but we practice daily Bible reading and Bible study. The Bible is the basis for all we believe. Every word in the Bible is to be trusted. Why? Because it is perfectly and divinely inspired. The scriptures find their fulfillment in Christ, and they reveal to us salvation that comes by faith in Jesus. We would have no knowledge about Jesus and God's plan to save us if we didn't have the Bible. The main purpose of the Bible is to point us to Jesus Christ and to tell us how to be saved. Other purposes include teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, and equipping for good works. It's truth without error. Truth without error. Psalm 19, 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true, making wise the simple. So just as God is just and perfect, his word is perfect. Human wisdom will fail and the traditions of man will not last, but the word of God never fails. Everything we do as Baptists comes from the word of God. It is our guide and our plumb line of truth. So we established the Bible as the word of God. Secondly, Jesus is the son of God. John 14, six, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures in Acts chapter 4, where it says the stone that you builders are rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation and no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on them to save them. Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. He lived a sinless life on earth and voluntarily paid for our sin by dying on the cross as our substitute. This accomplished salvation for all who receive grace by trusting in him alone. He rose from the dead and is the only mediator between God and us. He baptizes believers in the Holy Spirit and will return to earth to consummate history. 
not only the Bible, the word of God and Jesus is the son of God. We know that you must be born again. John chapter three tells us that in second Corinthians five, Paul writes, when anyone becomes a Christian, he becomes a new person inside. The old passes the way the new life has begun. Matthew 16, Jesus said, if you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. You see, God had created humans to have fellowship with him, but they defied God by simply going their own way. And as a result, we need God's saving grace to end our alienation, our separation from him. Salvation comes only through God's grace. No human effort. It must be received personally by repentance and faith. Repentance is simply just turning from your sin, going God's direction instead of away from him. And at the end, everyone will experience bodily resurrection and the judgment, but only believers will enjoy eternal fellowship with God. Lastly here, believers are spirit-filled and spirit-led. Scriptures say in Acts 1, uh, 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Ephesians 5.18, Paul writes to the church, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus in Luke chapter 11.13, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We believe the only way possible to live the Christian life is by God's power within us. Every believer can be filled with the Holy Spirit by simply asking. We seek to practice a daily dependence on God's Spirit to enable us to do what is right. What about our salvation beliefs? Man's nature is sinful. The sinful nature we talk about is what makes us rebellious against God. When we talk about the sin nature, we talk about the fact that we have a natural desire to sin. Even if we were to choose to do God's will or to sin, we will naturally choose to do our own thing. So proof of this nature abounds. You don't have to teach a child to lie or to be selfish. Rather, we go to great lengths to teach children to what? Tell the truth and to what? To put others first. But sinful nature comes to us naturally. So we see tragic examples of mankind acting badly. Honestly, wherever people are, there is trouble. So the Bible explains the reason for the trouble. Humanity is sinful, not just theory or in practice, but by nature. Sin is part of the very fiber of our being. The Bible speaks of sinful flesh in Romans 8.3. It's our earthly nature to produce the list of sins in Colossians 3.5. Romans 6.6 6 says that the body is ruled by sin. The flesh and blood existence that we lead on this earth is shaped by our sinful, corrupt nature. So sin is universal in all humanity, right? All of us have the sin nature. It affects all of us. Paul says that the trouble is with me, for I am all too human a slave to sin, Romans 7, 14. Paul was in his sinful nature a slave to the law of sin, Romans 7, 25. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, 6, says all of us have, like sheep, have gone astray. Even the wise King Solomon of Israel said, indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins in Ecclesiastes 7.20. The Apostle John even says in 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So man's nature is sinful, yes. Salvation is by grace alone. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. Salvation by grace through faith is the very heart of the Christian, at the heart of the Christian religion. The statement has three parts, if you'll notice. It is salvation, it is grace, and it is faith. All equally important. These three together constitute a basic tenet of Christianity. The word salvation is defined as the act of being delivered, redeemed, or rescued. The Bible tells us that since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis, that every person is born into is sin, born, it's inherited the sin 
as you are born. And we get that from Adam, Romans 5, 12. Sin is what causes us all to die. Sin is what separates us from God, right? Sin destines us to a eternal separation from God and hell. So what each of us needs is to be delivered, right? We all need to be redeemed or rescued, right? In other words, we need salvation from our sin and its penalty. So how are we saved from sin? Well, <clears throat> we all teach like good works, that salvation is achieved if we are just a good person. Others say that if we live a moral life, that that's a way to atone from our sin. Uh, we can be sorry for our sin, and that's good enough. And we may repent, and sometimes that's valuable. But And we may say, you know, I'll never sin again. That's the deal. But salvation is not a result of good intentions. So the road to hell, as the saying goes, is paved with good intentions. But we may fill our lives with good works. However, it's, we're still a sinner in practice. We're already sinners in practice. We were born that way. So now how, how good what we may be or how good intentions that we may have, the fact is we simply don't have the power or the goodness to overcome the sin nature we inherited from Adam. So we need something more powerful. And this is where grace comes in, right? God uh, granted us his grace and undeserved favor. And to those, he has called to salvation through his love, Ephesians 2, 5, 4 to 5. It's his grace that saves us from sin. We're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, Romans 3, 24. So being justified simply means that it's a legal term that we are vindicated. We're determined. Jesus made a statement when he died on the cross that those that believe in him, we are declared sinless, right, in the eyes of God. And so our sin no longer separates us from him and no longer sentences us to hell. So grace is not earned by any effort. Grace is free. If our good works earn salvation, then God will be obligated to pay us our due. But no one can earn heaven, right? God's blessings are not his obligation. They flow out of God's goodness and his love. So no matter how hard we pursue works to gain God's favor, we fail. Our sin trips us up every time. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, Romans 3, 20. So the means that God chose to bestow his grace upon us is faith. Remember, we talked about salvation. We talked about salvation, our grace. Now we talk about faith. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Salvation is obtained by faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done really the, his death on the cross and his resurrection. But even faith is not something we generate in our, on our own. Faith, as well as grace, is the gift of God, right? Bestows saving faith and saving grace upon us in order to rescue us or redeem us from sin and deliver us from sin's consequences. So God saves us by his grace through faith he gives us. So both grace and faith are a gift from God. Psalm 3, 8 says salvation belongs to the Lord. So by grace, we receive the faith that enables us to believe that he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, provide the salvation we cannot achieve on our own. Jesus as God in flesh is the author and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Just like the author of a book creates it from scratch, Jesus Christ wrote the story of our redemption from beginning to end. The Lord died for our sins and rose for our justification. And he forgives freely and fully to those who accept his gift of grace in Christ. And that acceptance comes through faith. This is the meaning of salvation by grace through faith. Man's nature is sinful. Salvation is by grace through faith and once saved, always saved. In other words, you cannot lose your salvation. Historically, this has been referred to as the perseverance of the saints. So assurance of salvation begins with God's promise in the scriptures, right? Perseverance of the saints talks about a continuing faith throughout the Christian life. How can somebody know that he or she will remain a Christian, right? First, there's the promise of God. Second, there's a demonstration of a Christian life until the end, right? 
in the Baptist faith message in Article 5, it says, all true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by his spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Yet they shall, yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So this means those who have fallen away from the faith sometime in their life, they were really never Christians in the first place. So assurance of salvation begins with God. The Bible says that we're kept, we're guarded, 1 Peter 1, 5, right? We're kept and guarded by God. God does this by his power through our faith. When we receive salvation, Paul says in Romans 8, 1, that we are in Christ, right? We're in Christ to begin a life of abiding in Christ, where Jesus explains in John chapter 15. Assurance of salvation is experienced by living out a life of faith, the Christian life, like Galatians 2.20 or Ephesians 3.17. Hebrews 3.14 says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the beginning of our insurance firm until the end. So our salvation beliefs are there as our belief is man is sinful in our nature we are sinful. And that salvation is by grace through faith and once saved, always saved. In other words, you cannot lose your salvation. Next, the letter A is autonomy of the church. Autonomy of the church simply means that every local congregation is invested with full authority to fulfill its ministry. There's no Baptist Pope, there's no Baptist bishops, there's no organization that's over us that dictates what we should do or what we believe. So we, the church called Allen Heights Baptist, we determine what to study in God's word. We determine what to do in worship. We determine what to give towards missions and what missions to be involved in. We determine what ministries to develop. We determine who are to be members. We determine what doctrine we believe in. And we even determine what sin is what's, and determine to rid it from our congregation. Of course, this is all dependent on the next point. Yes, we are autonomous, but we are under the lordship of Jesus. Not only do we believe that the autonomous right to be a New Testament church right here in Allen, Texas, it, it, and we honor the right for every New Testament church, we also believe that we stand together with those churches and declare the lordship of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.8 says he is also the head of the body, the church. He is in the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, plain and simple. See, unity comes when we are all loving him with, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving each other, not when we agree completely with each other. So that means that it is all about him, not us. And the Bible is filled with this message constantly and continually. Third, we believe we should covenant together, right? It's a contract or agreement to expressing God's gracious promises to his people and their relationship to, and then our relationship with him. So we find the word covenant all throughout the scriptures, the covenant with Noah, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Jacob, uh, the new covenant that Christ shares, that his blood is the blood of the new covenant which was shed for our sins. So we make our covenant with Christ church when we are part of the flock in a local setting, being a part of the body of Christ. This means we're accountable to God and to each other. The church is filled with baptized believers. The local body of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers. We believe, according to the scripture, that baptism is a believer's public confession of faith in Christ, a sign and symbol of your new birth. The Lord commands us in the Great Commission in Acts 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 2.38, Peter says, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Notice the order. In Acts 8.36, when the Ethiopian eunuch receives Christ after hearing the gospel message from Philip, he says, look, water, what prevents me from getting baptized? And Philip replies, if you believe with all your heart, then you may. It's written, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So our common baptism binds us together as, as believers and establishes the boundary of membership in the congregation. 
the called out ones, the church. Next, as we look at the letter P, it is the priesthood of believers. First Peter 2 9 says, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the ex excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelation 1 6 reads, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, and to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. In 1994, a report of the Presidential Theological Study Committee that was a section entitled The Priesthood of All Believers, and it simply read this, every Christian has direct access to God through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, the sole mediator between God and human beings. However, the priesthood of all believers is exercised within a committed community of fellow believers. Hey folks, that's the church priests who share a like precious faith. The priesthood of all believers should not be reduced to individualism. It should not be a cover for theological relativism. It's a spiritual standing which leads to ministry, service, and a witness in the world for which Christ died. What an amazing statement that we stand on as Baptists. Baptists believe that people had the opportunity to exercise their human right to believe Jesus as Lord and Savior. So we become priests when we do so. We're ever challenged as our priestly authority to baptize and administer the Lord's Supper. Baptists declare, as did the Anabaptists before us, that we have the authority from the Bible, which teaches that all believers in Christ are priests. I want you to take a look in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25 want you to look at the word since in the passage. It says, since we have confidence. It also since, says, since we have a great priest. I want you to notice that the answer is given. See, since we have great confidence, we enter the most holy place where God dwells. Since we have a great priest, which is Jesus, therefore we can what? We can draw near to God. Notice that phrase. We draw near to God with a sincere heart. We draw near to God with a full assurance of faith. We draw near to God because we have had our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. We can draw near to God having our bodies washed with pure water. All these draw nears cannot happen without Jesus, the great high priest. That's why this is called the new and living way. No more rituals to draw near. This new way means that it was unavailable before Christ, right? So the word confidence here means a free and open expression or a conduct. How do you approach God? Well, it's in prayer, right? You are the worshiper that is in God's presence constantly, and you are drawing near to him in worship, in prayer, by the work of Jesus Christ in your life as your Savior. Jesus is the one who allows us entrance into God's divine presence. Next is the two ordinances. We talked about this in the last session, but as we look at the B, A, P, and now the T, we notice that as Baptists, we practice and make sure that we have correct the baptism and the Lord's Supper. Ordinances, remember, mean they're, they're something that Jesus ordained for us to do. And so this is two things that we want to make sure we get right and practice well celebrating these ordinances in the life of the church. Next is evangelism and missions. Yes, I know it's E and M, but let's take the letter I out of both of the words. Hey, works for me. Hope it works for you. <laughs> but we, we, we have a great passion for evangelism and missions. So first of all, we need a kingdom mentality. Jesus said in the parables many times that the kingdom of heaven is like. Even John the Baptist preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, right? The realm is heaven and earth, and as the Son of God, he, Jesus, is the king. Jesus told us that because he lives in us, his children, the kingdom is within each of us, right? The kingdom is bigger than the church, but God invented the church 
to enlarge his kingdom. In fact, to help create his kingdom, right? Now, don't get me wrong. We are not the kingdom, but we're to help in kingdom work. So we need this kingdom mentality. Second is the church is a sending center, a outpost, if you say. It's to take the kingdom to every part of life. So when a disciple walks in the door of his or her office, the kingdom has arrived, right? A father and mother are participating in parenting or are a part of a marriage, right? The kingdom is there, right? And, and as long as they're believers in Jesus Christ. But the call for the disciple is to infiltrate and to take Christ's rule into government, into tourism, into schools, into sports, into business, into recreation, into the media, into journalism, and even the entertainment industry, right? The challenge remains to get people outside the building so they can be the church. See, we're very confused about that today. When you drive by, oh, there's the church. Well, that's not the biblical understanding of what church is. See, the plan for developing church growth is really about making disciples. It includes, listen, pay attention. It includes going and telling and serving. A lot of people think it's about inviting people to church, right? We've tried all of that inviting. We've even fluffed up the gospel. We've made people feel comfortable for too long. We're to go with Christ's feet, right? As ascending center, we're to, to go with Christ's feet. We're to tell with Christ's story, right? And the key word in telling and, and going is simply we are a witness in Acts 1.8. The word in the Greek is martis, which not only means witness, but it means martyr as well. It really means as, as a witness, we're to testify for what we've seen or what we've experienced in, their, in our life. And that, that one would give their life as a martyr to share this news, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the line where to go to tell, we're also to serve, to minister with Christ's hands, right? And so remember, we can even go back and look at the priest of the believer. We believe that, that pastors, in, in a lot of cases, are the professional priests in the church. And if we truly look at the priest of the believer, this is where we are all priests of the kingdom, where Christ died, right? And, and so as Christ died, the veil of the Holy of Holies was torn, giving all who believe access to the Most High God. So that means that as we go and tell and serve, we are also to equip the body to minister. And so first, I insist as pastor of Allen Heights Baptist Church, if you become a member here, that you are willing to be trained, right? You're willing to understand what it means to minister, not only to the body of Christ here at the local church, but also to outreach in the community. We read about equipping of the saints in Ephesians 4, we read about the good works God has planned for each one of us in Ephesians 2, and that should help you see that. So then in this context, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, we find out that every member is doing his part, pulling together for the purpose of God. All of these passages teach about God's, people's, uh, will they, God's people, they will be fulfilled and they're productive and the body will grow and build itself as long as Jesus, right, is the center and as long as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Next is there's two offices of the church, right? Two offices of the church. And I know I was a little bit weird, but we go back to the T, the final part. Two offices of the church is elder and deacon, right? The elder and the deacon are all about equipping and building in Ephesians 4. The word in the Greek means to prepare. It has many dimensions. It can mean to set a broken bone or to mend a fishing net or to furnish a house or to restore something to its original condition, to condition an athlete. So it's used in 2 Timothy 3.17, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So as we take a look at these offices, let's talk about the elder, the pastor first. The word pastor means to shepherd, to herd, to tend, to pasture, or to tend sheep. The Old Testament uses the word shepherding as leading a people. It's really to provide oversight, right? To rule, to labor, to 
lead. Elders are given authority in order to manage church affairs. To labor means that this responsibility requires work and their elders are expected to give their best. To lead, elders, pastors are to provide leadership, vision, direction for the church. So they are proactive instead of reactive, right? In pastoring, they're called to care, to protect, and to teach. Pastoral care is entrusted to elders, pastors. They're responsibly good examples of caring for people, uh, especially even during difficult times. To protect means that we're also to protect the flock from wolves and sheep's clothing, especially in doctrine or lifestyle or harmful attitudes. To teach, Paul wrote that Timothy should find others to which he can multiply himself. He's able to teach them. Not every elder needs to be gifted as a teacher in the formal sense, but they should be able to communicate the important truths of Christ to others. See, the broken need to be put back together. The unruly need to be corrected. The weak need to be strengthened. And the young need to be nourished. The church's pastoral team makes sure that this ministry takes place. We make sure that we all work together in making a great pastor and to be able to fulfill the responsibilities that God has before us. Second is the office of deacon. When deacons appear in the, in the Bible, it's because the Spirit prompts the apostles in Acts chapter 6 to ask the congregation to choose men who meet certain qualifications. They don't simply place a title on those who are currently serving. Instead, the Spirit mandates men who are of good repute, full of spirit, and of wisdom. The qualifications of deacon are about spiritual and leadership characteristics in Paul's letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Like pastors, they must manage their household with the assumption that like pastors, they're called on to care for God's church as a leader. You see, leadership is scripturally defined as servanthood. Deacons maintain the unity of the body by giving leadership to serving the temporal needs, right? Temporal needs. They're not a corporate board, nor are they a spiritual council of directors. They serve the body by removing potential obstacles to unity by meeting human needs. Deacons serve, but as they do, they equip the rest of the body to serve. Deacons organize servant ministry, whether it's serving the Lord's Supper on a Sunday morning or in life groups. Maybe it's supervising kids on a children's ministry outing, or maybe it's equipping saints to serve like organizing a blanket or a food drive. That kind of servant leadership is more significant than any corporate board or congregational or otherwise. All right, let's summarize what we've learned today in session two. Simply, we take the, the word Baptist, and uh, even though it's, it's one part is, is out of order, but we've taken the letters B-A-P-T-I-S-T, and kind of shared some basic beliefs of who we are. So I know work with me, work with me here on putting all this together, right? So uh, B was Bible's our authority. Uh, A was autonomy of the local church. P is the priesthood of the believer. Uh, T is the two ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, the I was the evangelism and missions, the I in both words. And so we uh, S is salvation beliefs, which we covered right after uh, the Bible is, is a, you know, is the biblical authority. The Bible is the very word of God. And then finally, the T, the last T is the two offices of the church, the pastor, uh, the, the elder, and the deacon. So we want to be able to share those with you and so that you're fully aware of, if you're considering church membership, uh, what it is that we stand on. And with those seven principles, there are more, but these are our seven core principles. If you'd like more information, look at sbc.net, sbc.net, and look up Baptist Faith and Message. So that is kind of our statement of faith that we stand on. And um, even though we're not, we don't have an organization above us, we partner with the Southern Baptist Convention, which we are a part of. And this Baptist Faith and Message is really a statement of faith that kind of binds all Southern Baptist churches together, unifies us under one statement. So that's where we're headed. Thank you so much for joining in, and hopefully you prayerfully consider church membership. Tune in for session three. Take you a break, or maybe take a day or two break. Tune in for session three, where we explore our structure and our strategy. Thank you. God bless.